Hi everybody, I guess this is Self-Health Awareness Month and so I thought I'd bring up uh, that subject in, in a way that we don't think about very often. Uh, when we're talking about taking care of ourselves or self-health, uh, I, I think one of the things that's important is to realize what's important to us and what makes uh, life, our, our situation better I think one of the most important things with what we do is we need that, we need that positive feedback from make, making people better. And fortunately, we're able to make people better on the spot. Um, when we have a run of difficult patients and they're a little hard to figure out, or maybe they're not even something we can fix, uh, that gets frustrating. And I, but I think it's important to recognize that that that's a pressure on us. And to me, the best way to address that is to find a way to actually fix the person or, or at least make a big change for that person. And the more consistently we can do that, the better. And that gives us the best reward, uh, the thing that helps us the most feel uh, satisfied with what we do, and I consider that a big part of self-help. Uh, well, we obviously know that we, we can get better at what we do, and the better we get, the, uh, the more people we can get better faster, and, and that brings on that reward that we feel and whether we realize it or not, we, we need a lot of that, especially after you've been doing this for a while because you're used to fixing people right away. And if you have a run or somebody that you can't fix, it's, it's pretty frustrating. So how do you minimize that and maximize the, the positive side? What, what I work on all the time, I think y you must do this too, is I try to get better and better at what I do. And there's, there's two things uh, that we have to really work on. One is getting good at the fixing part, uh, which means I can palpate better, I can identify things better, and but I'm actually better at manipulating them to fix them. But that really depends on the second thing, and that is the diagnostic process, figuring it out. Um, I know, I know it's not perfectly accurate or fair, but if, if I can't fix them on the first visit or know I'm going to fix them in one or two visits, I, I figure I have to concentrate a little harder and, and, and work a little harder. At, I, I get frustrated with it. That's, so I try really hard to do, uh, do the miracle cure on every single patient. I know we can't do that. Every day, every month, every year, I'm working on the diagnostic part probably more than the actual fixing part. Um, I'll give you an example the, of how important this is. There's a, uh, there's a football player in our local football team, unnamed, who uh, in the season before the COVID year, he, an offensive lineman has to, what they call punch, he has to really hit people really hard with his hand. You try to stand somebody up so that you can move them around or prevent them to getting around you. And uh, that's, a, that's a big jolt on the, on the arms. And he had hit somebody and his right arm went absolutely dead. And, and so he was trying to play with one arm. And, and I, I hadn't seen him, and he was working through, trying to work through that, and then the COVID year happened, and, and I wasn't there for the whole year, the whole season. And he would actually, he got to the point where he could hit somebody once, then the arm would be very weak, if not just dropping dead, and then he was really playing one-handed. And he actually played through a whole season that way. Well. He saw some people getting, getting better, so he asked me about this. And, 
and I f kind of figured I knew what it was, but I, I went through the process. I had him lean against a wall and do kind of a push up against a wall very slowly while I felt everything going on in the arm. And there were three things going on. There was the subscapularis, there was a problem in the corico, uh, clavicular ligaments, and, and then there was, I figured, a nerve problem because that whole neurovascular sleeve wasn't, didn't feel like it was moving freely. And that's what happened first. So I did our protocols and, and I tried to free, I did free that up underneath the coracoid process and, and got that moving and, and he stood up and he felt a whole lot better, his strength was better. Um, but then uh, it was not, he didn't have full strength and, and when he was hitting people again, it, it, his arm wouldn't go dead, but there was pain and he wasn't quite as strong at, as it was, uh, it, as it should be. So what I did, uh, oh, by the way, well, once I fixed the nerve problem, the subscapularis problem went away and I still had to work on the coracoclavicular ligaments, but that freed up pretty fast. And uh, so now I'm left with that nerve problem and I didn't fix it on the first visit. So he had a pretty good response. So I wasn't really depressed about it, but I, I was, you know, I needed, I needed to fix it as fast as I could. The, uh, so I followed the nerve around. Instead of approaching it from the subscapularis and then underneath the nerve, I went side on the side of the nerve and then underneath behind it from above the neurovascular bundle and then in between the scapula and the neurovascular bundle and then up to the coracoid process. And I literally lifted that whole neurovascular sleeve off of the subscapularis, the, the, uh, the scapula and the coracoid process, lifted it off of there. So what I was doing was I was following what my fingers were feeling and just followed that and, and until I found the problem and then freed that up and followed the line of tension until it was completely free. So it's not a protocol that we teach, but I, I was following you know, what I could feel with palpation. So he gets up, it's completely gone. Uh, he goes to practice, uh, the next day, uh, we, we, were at, uh, we, we were at another city uh, with, uh, with another team during a preseason. So I was seeing him every day and uh, it was 100% fixed, no problem. Couldn't even tell he ever had anything. And uh, so then I, that's obviously a nice reward. He's really excited. He's yelling to everybody, this guy's amazing. You know, he's the, I, I guess I have a nickname, the goat now, the, which I've never understood exactly what that means because years ago, that was a bad thing to be the goat, but now it's a good thing. The, uh, so a lot of great feedback, you know, of course, that's, that's what we live for. Um, but the reason I was able to get there is that my palpation skills and, and, and therefore the diagnostic skills were, were getting better and better and better. And, and I just never give up on trying to feel more things. So that's the road that never ends, but the rewards get better and better as we go. It's, it is stressful when you know the patient, this, they've been every place, they're, uh, they're often way beyond frustration with it, they're, they're hopeless. And, and that can get quite severe to where you start to wonder if they may you know, do something drastic. Uh, so we, we do get in that situation. The, the only way you can uh, fix that issue is to actually fix the problem and, and that puts a lot of pressure on us. So we have to really focus and, and spend whatever time is necessary with 100% effort. It's, it's a big effort to find something no one else has been able to find. Um, but at the very minimum, you should be able to eliminate a lot of possibilities uh, that are neuromuscular, mechanical, uh, myofascial, neuromyofascial, all those things. And then by the negative, then it, it might be something pathological and you, you should be able to feel 
what that might be or suspect it and then get them to the right person. So that's, that's getting a good result from a patient we can't even fix. Uh, but you need to at least be able to do that. And if, if you can be that persistent and be that, that good at your diagnostic palp and palpation skills, then you can provide the patient with that answer. Um, but often you'll be able to, to actually fix it when it's something really weird and off base, but it depends on developing those skills to do that. So those are the two most extreme cases. If you can do that, then that person will trust you to be the, the answer uh, from then on, and, and that word gets out. So you become the first choice. Uh, and then, of course, you may have to refer them to the right place if it's not for us to fix, but you can be that first choice. I, I'll literally tell them, I, I, I know everyone has, you've probably seen a lot of people who said they, they can or will fix it, and they don't, and it's very frustrating. But the reason that happens is that they haven't found the cause. That's almost always the reason. Sometimes they find the cause, but they don't have the tools to fix it. And those are the two possibilities. So what we need to do today is find the cause, and that will determine whether you get better or not. So I'm gonna do everything I can to find the cause, and I'm gonna explain all these steps along the way. When I find the cause, it'll be obvious to you and it'll be obvious to me that that's what the cause is. To make that long story short, what I'm trying to illustrate is that if we continue to work really hard at feeling structures and using that diagnostic process to find things, uh, and, and some of it is actually finding that nothing's wrong here, so therefore it must be someplace else, so it's working off a negative. If we work really hard at that, we get much more of that gratification uh, and, it, and it just comes in waves. So I, I guess you call it, that's my self-health self tip uh, if, if you'll allow me to do that.